all you as the advocates, it's been a busy year with lots of changes. So we wanted to take a few moments to fill you in on some of the updates since this webinar was originally recorded. In part because of the COVID-19 pandemic, 48 state dental boards made changes to the initial dental licensure process for the class of 2020. All testing agencies now offer a mannequin-based component for alternative exam in place of a live patient clinical exam. The DLOSCI is now accepted in six states, Alaska, Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Oregon, and Washington. We've seen student success utilizing these alternative methods for licensure in 2020 and 2021. Now, as is advocating for states to make these changes permanent. Following the November 2020 election, there are currently five dentists in the 117th Congress, including Mike Simpson, Paul Gozer, Brian Babin, Drew Ferguson, and Jeff Andrew, all members of the Republican Party. The CARES Act is a $2.2 trillion economic stimulus bill passed in March 2020 and in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Its student loan relief provisions have been extended three times now by executive orders, so that it is now extended through at least September 30th, 2021. The student loan provisions include suspension of student loan payments, a 0% interest rate on student loans, and halted collections on defaulted loans. It was very exciting to see so much progress on the dental advocacy front last year, and we are excited to see what the future holds for ASDA and all of our student advocates this year. All right, let's go ahead and get started then. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us for Advocacy 101. My name is Sebastian Sellis, and I currently serve as the Council on Advocacy Chair, and I'm also today's moderator. I am a third year at Columbia University College of Dental Medicine, and I wanted to welcome you all to our webinar this evening, and thank you all for listening along. The session today will cover the importance of advocacy on a local, state, and national level. Some common advocacy misconceptions, key legislative priorities that ASDA focuses on, and how to stay informed and get involved with advocacy. Before we begin, I'd like to share a couple of housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded and available to ASDA members through our website on July 30th. Uh, next slide, please. There you go. I would also like to introduce our speakers. Um, so today we'll have Greg Benz. He is an entering third year student at Illinois and legislative coordinator for districts six and seven on ASDA's National Council on Advocacy. We'll also have Colton Cannon. He is an entering second year student. I still can't believe that he well, you know, made it to trustee first year. He is a powerhouse. Uh, he's from he goes to school in Minnesota and is the District 8 trustee, like I said, on ASDA's National Board of um, Trustees. We also have, uh, last but not least, Jake Holtzman. He is like the powerhouse and the workhorse of the council. He is an entering third year student at Colorado and legislative coordinator for Districts 8 and 9 on ASDA's National Council on Advocacy. We're also lucky to be joined by our two ASDA advocacy staff members, Stephanie Follett and Robin Lieberman. And let me tell you, they are the backbone of ASDA. So if you ever hear from someone outside of our, fair, uh, of our main four presenters, it will probably be one of them. We will take questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, questions can be submitted at any time through the control panel located on the right-hand side. And at the end, once we're all finished presenting, we will address all those questions. So be, you're more than welcome to uh, ask the questions at any point during the presentation. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with some advocacy misconceptions. Number one, I am not a politician. I don't have a strong political background or extensive knowledge of the issues. Well, lucky for you, sometimes um, being a politician is not exactly what we strive for, right? We, have, we all come from varying levels of knowledge and we're all subject matter experts at our own specific field, right? And if we were all politicians, that would really crowd the field. Um, by providing really expert knowledge to politicians, that's actually really helpful for, for the politicians to make decisions since politicians can't uh, know everything, right? So. Um, also, if you don't have a strong political background, you have come to the right place here at Advocacy 101. We're here to kind of give you all the information, all the basics when it comes to legislation. Number two, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, legislators don't listen to students and young voters. So um, if I know that sometimes uh, given 
you know, different administrations and things like that, it might seem a little futile to really put so much effort in. And it's understandable, but I think that at the end of the day, we need to all just remember that it takes small steps to kind of accomplish big things. And legislators don't listen to students. I would actually just speak from personal experience. Uh, when I went to lobby day, you know, I think these legislators and their representatives are kind of get a little tired of uh, listening to adults talking all the time. So they really appreciate the fresh experience and the kind of like the fresh voices that we represent. And especially when we're talking about things like student loan debt and things like that, uh, they really want to hear it firsthand how student loan debt, for example, can be impacting and uh, negatively impacting our lives. So uh, I highly recommend that when you uh, go to lobby day to definitely speak to your representatives since they are very much willing to listen. And also we are young voters, you know, and we uh, did elect them. So we are their constituents. So, you know, we are there to for them to hear us out. Number three, advocacy and partisan politics are two sides of the same coin. So luckily, uh, as I'll note later, advocacy and lobbying are two different things. And ASDA tries to be as bipartisan as possible. We don't don't affiliate with any specific political party, and um, as I'll mention later on, and so we really try to focus on what matters the most as our identity, as you know, dental professionals, as students, um, as well as our patient population. So uh, advocating for healthcare access, for example. So these are all things that are kind of like human values, not really anything that's specific to any political party. And last but not least, advocacy takes too much time. You know, I am not gonna say it's completely false. And I think it really depends on how much time you'd like to give it because, you know, you can spend four days, let's say, and during lobby day and go to DC and spend time, you know, flying over there and talking to your representative. And yeah, sure, that takes a few days, but at, at the other side of the coin, it could also take 30 seconds. Uh, if you use the ASDA action alerts and you send and submit uh, pre-written uh, templates to your representatives about different acts, such as like the ELSA Act or the Ready Act. Um, and that really takes a few clicks. So it really, you know, runs the gamut in terms of it can take 30 seconds or a few days. And uh, saying it takes too much time is a bit of a stretch. All right, so some differentiations between the federal government and the state government. So as far as where we uh, they get their power and legitimacy. So for the federal government, it comes from the US Constitution directly. At the state level, it comes from the Bill of Rights, the 10th Amendment. Uh, federal uh, government executes authority over national issues, such as declaring war and immigration, for example. And any law that's put into place at the federal level should be followed at the state level. So the main example here is one letter uh, of support that we uh, recently um, supported uh, regarding taxes, which is the House Resolution 7216, the Small Business uh, PPE Tax Credit Act which uh, this bill would actually provide a tax credit of up to $25,000 for PPE costs for small businesses. And this includes gloves and masks, but also any retrofitting costs or equipment purchased to mitigate exposure to COVID-19. So this is something that can be applied to all states, right? At the state level, we have they have the power to reserve the powers not granted to the federal government by the constitution, and these are more state issues. So this includes, you know, licenses and, you know, on one end, you could be a driver's license. On the other, maybe more importantly for you and more relevant uh, is uh, the dental license. So licensure reform, as much as we would love to have an overarching thing that covers all states at once, we do have to go at a state by state level and make uh, policy changes uh, state by state. All right, so how a bill becomes a law. Um, so if you're not familiar with Schoolhouse Rock, I'm a little bit on the older side, but I definitely recommend you to uh, YouTube it, see a video of it, it explains it wonderfully, and I will do my best. So uh, we can go to the next slide here. Yeah, so every bill uh, starts with an idea, right? So that's why we are here. We're here to be creators and innovators and think of uh, smart ways to solve big problems, right? And we can tackle them head on. and make sure that we're working together and collaborating to create that idea and turn it into life and draft it. So once it's drafted, the bill is introduced um, into Congress and then it goes into a committee. And the committee level is where all the compromise, all the negotiations happen, you know, tit for tat. Sometimes, you know, we want the most ideal bill, but in order for it to turn into law, we need to have some bipartisanship, right? And so we need to have some compromise and that's where that happens. Once the bill has been finalized, that's when it goes to Congress for debating and ultimately for voting. And so let's say it's approved in the House, then it has to go to the Senate to get that majority approval as well and vice versa. Lastly, 
uh, if the bill is passed by both houses in Congress, then it goes straight to the president and the president has the ability to sign it into law. If it gets vetoed for whatever reason, then you need a super majority from both houses in order to make that bill turn into a law. But again, I recommend that YouTube video, uh, The Schoolhouse Rock. It's a lot of fun and very catchy. All right, so as I mentioned, we are one bipartisan effort working together with the ADA. We are not Republicans, Democrats, we are the tooth party, right? And this is one of my favorite things to say is that we're the tooth party. We represent ourselves and our patients. And so we be advocate on behalf of our patients and our profession, not a political party. And last year, we actually had the pleasure of saying that we had five dentists in Congress and uh, representing both uh, the two major political parties, Democrats and Republicans. Unfortunately, this year, our one Democrat uh, changed parties to Republicans. So we can't say that this year, but hopefully in the years to come, we can say that, you know, this is uh, bipartisan and we have representation from dentists on both sides. And who knows, maybe in a few years, we'll have another dentist that's listening to us right now turning into a politician. So, you know, here's to that. I believe that is the end of my segment. So Greg, I believe you're gonna uh, go over some issues. So take it away. All right, thank you so much for the introduction, uh, Sebastian. Uh, Colton and I are now gonna go over a few issues that are important to us as dental students. Uh, just a quick disclaimer, this is meant to be kind of an overall introduction and is by no means a comprehensive presentation of some complex topics. Uh, like Sebastian just said, we are focused on lobbying for dentistry as a whole, and we do not identify with a particular party. Um, so the first issue is licensure reform, and it's a pretty exciting time for dental licensure reform. Um, but it goes way back, and the timeline on the right of the screen shows that the implementation of the clinical examination began uh, in 1929. Uh, however, it was not until 1991 that the live patient exam was recognized as inappropriate and un unethical. In 2016, as they released the policy on licensure, and we have taken significant strides since then. There are currently sev several states that have accepted non-patient-based alternatives as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, 27 states have altered licensure requirements in light of the pandemic, which affects 42 chapters of as does 66 chapters. Some of the alternatives include mannequin-based exams and the DL OSCE, which stands for Dental Licensure Objective Structured Clinical Examination. It's a mouthful, so from here on out, I'll just be referring to it as the OSCE. The DL OSCE is a high-stakes licensure examination developed by the Joint Commission on National Dental Examinations, and it actually has its roots tied to ASDA. In 2015, past president Christian Peers submitted a request to the ADA Council on Dental Education and Licensure to develop a business plan to create an OSCE exam. Earlier this year, in five years since that letter, the ADA announced expedited plans to release the DL OSCE in light of the national crisis. The exam is currently accepted in Alaska, Colorado, Iowa, Oregon, and Washington. In the 2000s, ASDA, the ADA, and ADEA have taken stances in favor of elimination of human subjects as part of the clinical licensure examination. So why is this a big deal? First of all, the exam is not valid. There's no real correlation to passing the exam and being a good dentist. Some individuals that pass the exam, exam may not be the most competent. And on the contrary, some individuals that fail the exam may be outstanding clinicians. The exam is not the best indicator of clinical skills required to succeed beyond dental school. The next problem is that the exam is not reliable. There is no way to standard, standardize the exam. No two lesions are the same, no examiner is the same, and no clinical environment uh, can be the same. Next, the exam does not put the best interests of the patient first. Some students will delay treatment because they have a patient that has a prime class two or class three lesion, and others may overdiagnose caries in order to obtain a patient to use for the examination. This is unethical, and as dentists, as future dentists, we have an obligation to provide the best care possible for our patients. 
The exam places candidates in positions of moral distress. All parties are put in, awkward, in an awkward situation if the student does not pass the examination. The patient retrieved a uh, treatment that is below standard of care, and what should they do now? Lastly, the exam is not universally ex accepted. Licensure portability, portability is a major concern for many new graduates, and the requirements are set by each individual state's licensing body. So what is ASDA doing about licensure reform? As I mentioned before, ASDA published the white paper in October of 2016, and that outlines the problems with the current licensure process. The L1 policy states the ideal licensure exam should include the following. It does not use human subjects in a live testing scenario. It supports a psychometrically valid and reliable assessment it is reflective of the scope of current dental practice, and it is universally accepted. In addition to making policies, ASA was instrumental in publishing reports on the task force uh, on the assessment of, of readiness for practice, and ASA was instrumental in the formation of the Coalition for Modernizing Dental Licensure. ASA's alternate examination should include a mannequin-based kinesthetic assessment and that's in order to demonstrate the necessary hand skills, a non-patient-based OSCE, and a submission of a portfolio. These three things should be enough to demonstrate that the graduates are competent for licensure. Pre-COVID, Connecticut was the most recent to eliminate the live patient portion of the exam in July of 2019. As the chapter presidents sent a letter asking for licensure reform in April, and states uh, have had different, uh, each state had different requests based on their current uh, licensure status. The next topic I wanted to touch on is one very close to my heart, and I'm sure all of yours also, and that is student debt. The figure shows that in 2018, the average debt for a dental school graduate was 2000 $285,184, and 80% of 2018 graduates had at least $100,000 of debt. These are huge numbers, and that really impacts what students uh, plan to do post-graduation. Uh, I really believe that if the number associated with student debt were lower, more recent graduates would be inclined to participate in public health initiatives and potentially lessen the access to care burden that we're seeing. Instead, we're all focused on paying back student loans. ASA encourages uh, to support reductions on federal student loan interest rates, to provide refinancing opportunities, and to provide opportunities for loan forgiveness, scholarships, grants, and tax deductions. Currently, due to COVID-19, Rates have been frozen at 0% from March 13th to September 30th as part of the CARES Act law, which provides relief to federal student loan borrowers. For the upcoming year, Congress has set student loan interest rates um, for the direct grad loan at 4.3% and the grad plus loan at 5.3%. And that's pretty much uh, two to three percent lower than when I started dental school. So I hope that trend can continue in that direction. With that, I'd like to pass it along to Colt. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you to Greg and Sebastian for your insightful comments. So ASA's mission statement is an organization that represents the rights, welfare, and interests of dental students. So an important question is, what is ASA doing about this? So student loans are obviously an issue in dentistry. It's been clear and proven, and what Greg just said, we can all agree it's an issue. So what ASA has done about it is lobby to include certain principles in the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. This reauthorization is long overdue. So this act pretty much states and gives the power of the federal government to control some of the financial aspects involved with higher education. We've encouraged representatives to co-sponsor the Student Loan Free Financing and Recalculation Act. So this act determines interest rates and what it costs to borrow money from the federal government. ASA has also signed a letter to introduce the Resident Education Deferred Interest Act, or the Ready Act. This act pretty much states that if an individual 
is in a residency program, they are deferred interest and deferred payments until graduation from that program. As we know in the current cases, sometimes um, residency programs aren't fully funded and that causes an issue when it comes to people pursuing these specific specialties. Next slide. So another area of kind of criticality that AS is looking into is mid-level providers. So based on AS's definition, a mid-level provider is an individual who is not a dentist with four years of post-collegiate education who may perform irreversible procedures on the public. So another way that you've probably heard mid-level providers is referred to as dental therapists or advanced dental therapists. Several states within our country and where schools are located have established mid-level provider programs, such as Alaska, Minnesota, Maine, Vermont, New Mexico, Nevada, Washington, Oregon, Arizona, Michigan, Idaho, and Montana. So after saying that, you can see mid-level providers are either being trained and educated and are still practicing in several states within our country. So the main reason that mid-level providers were introduced is to reduce barriers to care. The thought is that mid-level providers would go out into rural areas or areas that are underserved in the way to increase provider access and reduce some of the necessary barriers to care. But as advocate, ASDA has advocated, mid-level providers are not the solution to the problem and we have several examples coming forward. So a little bit about ASDA's C2 policy. So this is the policy that states of what a qualified dentist should do. So this policy was introduced at the 2014 House of Delegates meeting and was then refined at the 2018 House of Delegates meeting. The goal of this was to authorize what a dentist should do. So someone that has a DDS or DMD equivalent degree. So it's prescribed drugs, perform irreversible dental procedures, prescribe work authorizations and diagnose dental treatment plans. So these are kind of the basic fundamental necessities of what a dentist does and what they're educated to do at a high level in order to protect the patient. So the main reason why we're saying this is dentists go through a high level of clinical training and a high level of expertise to be able to do these certain things in order to protect the public and make sure we have a high quality of care. So alternatives to dental therapy that will help, re help reduce barriers to care is the Children's Health Insurance Program, also known as CHIP. This is a Medicaid supplement program that provides children in the United States the ability to see a dentist and get oral health care. Increase Medicaid reimbursement rates and extend coverage of procedures. So another issue is that Medicaid reimbursement rates are so low that dentists often have to see patients at a loss. When dentists often see patients at a loss, they will defer patients and not accept new patients who take that type of insurance. Increase Health Service Corps job and opportunities for dentists in underserved areas. So things like the Indian Health Service Corps or federally qualified health centers that allow individuals who are often newly graduating from schools the ability to practice with potential loan forgiveness programs in order to make a kind of quality living while serving these underserved areas. Increased participation in outreach programs, such as Give Kid a Smile or Mission of Mercy. These programs help allow dentists to go out into these areas and see patients who desperately need dental coverage. Community dental health coordinators, individuals in the community who are trained and educated to be able to connect patients with providers. ER referral programs, so pro when someone has a condition that requires them to go to the ER or has a dental emergency, that the ER referral programs can connect the patient with a dental provider to not only get the care that they need at that time being, but also receive preventative care. And something kind of really important today is teledentistry, something that allows individuals to connect with dentists and other aspects and other avenues that they might not traditionally have. Next slide. So what is ASDA doing about this? ASDA is committed to advocate, advocacy and legislation that helps alleviate barriers to care. We support the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act, which requires companies to cover the cost of medically necessary services due to congenital abnormalities. So a recent update that we had was on April 17, 2020, ASDA along with, other 50, along with 50 other dental organizations signed a letter requesting that the Department of Health and Human Services and Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services provide immediately access to capital by releasing fundings from the CARES Act Provider Relief Fund to dentists that are Medicaid providers. So this pretty much states is increasing the level of funding to Medicare and Medicaid providers so they can see these patients. As again, supports Medicaid expansion at the state level and hopes that all states expand it to include coverage for all individuals who suffer from barriers to care. As this helps successfully get the Action for Dental Health Act passed with expanded funding for vulnerable populations. 
As we've seen, a lot of the barriers to care are directly related to vulnerable populations who can't see providers that they need necessary. Next slide. And I will pass it over to Jake, who will update you here from now on. Awesome. Thanks for getting us ready to make a difference, Colton, Greg, and Sebastian. So since all of us as the colleagues have invested our time tonight to learn about the structure of our government and the, issue, and the issues that as the champions like Colton and Greg talked about, it's time for us to take that next step to get involved. With everything that dental students have going on in their busy schedules, I feel like sometimes the direction to get involved carries a heavy and sometimes anxiety inducing weight with it. If you feel like that, don't worry because you're not alone. We can't learn it all and advocate for every bill, but as professional students that'll be healthcare providers someday, I think there's some things that all of us can do to advocate for our colleagues and our patients. So let's break it down really quick and summarize how we can get involved in ASDA advocacy at the local and national levels. First and most importantly, let's vote. Even though our federal representatives and the presidency get a lot of attention, the majority of legislative decisions that affect our communities are made by our local and state governments. If we aren't being active participants in every local election, we're giving everyone else an opportunity to speak for us on important issues like health care, student debt, and barriers to care. Before we vote, we need to make sure that we educate ourselves on the issues, the candidates, and the facts, just like all of you are making the dedication to do tonight. Together, let's make sure that we check out Ballotpedia, ASDA's ASDA Action Platform, and other fact-driven resources that'll help us educate ourselves about our candidates. In grassroots advocacy, just like in voting, it's always been a great idea to start local. If you're looking for a good place to start, get in touch with your local chapter's legislative liaison to figure out how you can start advocating for a cause, and then prepare yourself to help educate your classmates and colleagues about that issue at chapter advocacy events. In addition to our local ASDA chapters, our local and state dental organizations can be super effective vehicles for making a change. <clears throat> if there's something you're particularly passionate about and wanna take it to the next level, consider engaging with your local and state dental organizations. Through networking and support, dental students can work with these organizations to push issues, agendas, and ideas to our state dental boards and state legislators. In fact, this is exactly what former National ASDA President Dr. Christian Pierce did when he was in dental school at Colorado, along with what he did with the ADA, as uh, Greg mentioned. After getting turned away by the State Dental Board for his efforts to increase portability of dental licensure in Colorado, he reached out to his local and state dental organizations. Together, pushed by Dr. Pierce's vision, the Colorado Dental Association pushed the Colorado State Dental Board to make Colorado the most accessible state in the country in terms of dental licensure. All right, so next. So next we'll talk about as the lobby days. Although I know that many of our state and national lobby days might not happen this year due to COVID-19, we'll have to see. Uh, these are some great opportunities to have our, our voices heard by the people making this decisions, state and federal legislators. Attending these events can sometimes be daunting, so I wanted to include a few tips that can help all of us get the most out of our Lobby Day experience, whenever that might be. I shamelessly call it the Lobby Day 123. First, let's plan ahead. Use as to action and other resources to learn who your representatives are. About a week or two before Lobby Day, it's really effective to reach out to their offices via email to let them know when you'll be there, why you'll be there, and to ask for a few minutes of their time. Second, work with your local dental organizations and chapters to create talking points and select important issues that you really want to advocate for when you get the chance to meet with the legislators. Third, make sure to follow up with a thank you note. This is a great way to begin building relationships with your lawmakers. This can also be a great opportunity to include your ask, as sometimes lobbyists call it, of your legislator in case you forget to during your conversation. But remember, every lobby day is different, especially if lobby days are held virtually or in some other form this year. Just keep these tips in mind while you follow your local chapter's lead. 
So before we wrap up, well, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. How else can ASDA help you get involved? And our big answer this year as a council is ASDA Action. It's ASDA's official new grassroots advocacy platform, and we need all of your help in getting as many ASDA members signed up as possible. Together, we can use this platform to encourage our elected officials to support a bill, review state and federal legislation, look up candidates running for office, and we can find out who our elected officials are. So check it out on ASDA's website. Just after this meeting, go ahead and Google search ASDA Action and sign up your phone number and your email address so that you can receive text messages and email alerts about important advocacy efforts. Spoiler alert if you haven't heard already, there's a huge prize that's going to be awarded to the school that has the highest percentage of signups at the conclusion of Advocacy Month. So get everybody signed up. Next slide, please. All right. We also wanted to highlight a few of other of ASDA resources that can help you get involved and encourage you to get pumped for Advocacy Month this November. Throughout this coming year, <clears throat> be sure to tune into the rest of Council on Advocacy's webinars. The Council has worked hard to put together a good slate of topics that can help us all be better advocates. Next month, on August 26, the Council on Advocacy is excited to announce that we'll be joined by the current Assistant Surgeon General of the United States of America, Rear Admiral Dr. Tim Ricks. We'll also be joined by the ADA Director of the Council on Access Prevention and Interprofessional Relations, Dr. Jane Grover. <clears throat> Together, Dr. Ricks and Dr. Grover are preparing a presentation about advocacy, public health, and the effects of COVID-19. Make sure you let your friends know about this one because none of us are going to want to miss it. If you're looking for a good way to get to the latest legislative updates from around the country, check out the monthly ASDA advocacy briefs in your email. Council members and other interested students will also be publishing articles and contour our national ASDA blog and chapter blogs about how ad, about hot advocacy topics, new successful initiatives, and much more. If you haven't heard about it already, make sure to check out ASDA's Advocacy Certificate Program. This is a great way to keep your advocacy efforts on track and even be rewarded at the end of the year. In fact, attending tonight's webinar ends you a point for this program. Last, be on the lookout to see if everyone's favorite molar bear makes a fall appearance before going into hibernation. Work with your chapter legislative liaisons to start planning for this year's Advocacy Month and think of creative ways to educate your colleagues and engage in advocacy. Leading up to the fall elections this year, many chapters have expressed great interest in hosting a voter registration and a commit to vote drive. To help everyone in their efforts, the Council on Advocacy has put together a tips and, trips, a tips and tricks to voter registration drives that will be distributed to chapters soon. Next slide, last slide. And first, you know, I know that was a lot of information, but when all is said and done, let your passion be your guide. If you get fired up when you hear about <clears throat> that the average dental student comes out of dental school with over 280 grand in debt, like Greg talked about, study up on ASA's F4 policy and start pressuring your lawmakers to make a change. If you get fired up when you learn more about the oral health disparities that continue to persist in a society as collectively wealthy as ours, study up on ASA's H1 and H2 policies and start pressuring your lawmakers to make a change. Whatever it might be, champion an issue close to your heart and be the change that you want to see with ASA advocacy. And with that, I'll turn it over to Sebastian to wrap things up, and I think we'll probably go with some questions. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Jake, Greg, and Colton. So we appreciate you uh, speaking with us today. So one thing that I actually got from this presentation right now is that I think that we need more innovators with our specific experience in order to create smart policy. For instance, uh, as the fully supports reducing barriers to care, but the mid-level provider solution that Colton spoke about did not do what it set out to accomplish, right? So I think we need creative, fresh minds to tackle issues like these so that we can start on the right foot at the probably most important and fundamental step, which is coming up with that initial, smart, fully thought out, fact-based idea, right? Uh, so yeah, so now it's time for question and answer. So now we'll be taking questions about the presentation. 
let's see what we have. All right, so coming from a school that is a huge proponent, proponent of dental therapists, which is mid-level providers, right? How would you suggest talking about alternative solutions when it feels taboo to say anything negative about dental therapists? Um, one thing that I wanted to say is, first of all, I think it's we should be promoting and condoning open conversations, right? So uh, it's not like we have the answers to everything and being able to have, as I mentioned, that bi-directional communication and Speaking of pros and cons in a civil and respectful manner really goes a long way. Um, another thing that I would recommend if uh, there are big proponents is that, for example, in my school, you don't really see that, right? So a lot of us um, are kind of opposed to that idea. And so I would suggest maybe creating an event that um, has a healthy debate, right, about this topic. And I think that's one of the things that as the advocacy does well is are those like really healthy uh, debates that actually garner a lot of attention. Um, did anybody else have any comments on this question? Any of our presenters? Yeah, I can speak a little bit on that. So I come from Minnesota, which has a large dental therapist population. Um, and we educate a fair amount each year. Um, I would say the biggest thing is just become educated on it. Um, speak with the students, speak with them, and just be able to have a dialogue, like Sebastian says, and come to the conclusions and come to aspects um, that kind of you believe in and you're passionate about, um, and just be just be willing and have an open mind to learn more and engage in some of those conversations. Great. All right, so question number two, how can I get students in my chapter excited about advocacy? Greg, did you want to take this one? Yeah, I can take that. Thanks, Sebastian. Uh, good question. And I'm going to give a really cliche answer at first, but that is increase awareness about advocacy at your school. Uh, you will be really surprised uh, the response that you get just by holding a discussion about it. Um, personally, I started throwing tidbits of advocacy in our town hall meetings, which would be something to do at like, what is your, uh, what is ASDA at your chapter type of presentation? which I'm assuming most chapters will be holding virtually this year. The other thing to do would uh, be advertise the uh, certificate program that Jake talked about, and that's a way for regular members to get involved, and that provides an incentive. Lastly would be provide something tangible to them. Um, previous, in the previous year, we provided people an opportunity to go to our state lobby day, and that really incorporated just regular chapter level members outside of the uh, executive board on our chapter to want to engage and learn more about it so that they can speak to representatives on dental issues. Yeah, uh, all great points, Greg. Um, one thing that I wanted to add is that for Columbia, uh, so we have this like farmer's market every Tuesday and one day uh, my legislative team decided to kind of go out there and give out free hot chocolate uh, during like an autumn day, I think it was October, actually it was November for Advocacy Month. And um, in the cups for the hot chocolate, we actually added information about policies that we were supporting or opposing at the time. And so that's a really quick and easy way for them to like read up on the policy and like, wait, student debt? And all I need to do is just, you know, a few clicks on as the action alert and, you know, I can talk to my representative that way. Little easy things like that can really go a long way. Um, okay, so no, question number three. Great job, oh, thank you. Uh, will this recording be available? Yes, the recording will be available on July 30th. So stay tuned for that. Um, okay, so uh, question number four. I'm a new legislative liaison for my as a chapter. How do I learn to be an exceptional liaison? Great question. Uh, Jake, did you wanna take that one? Yeah, yeah, I'll start on this one. Um, great question, and you know, we're all we all start somewhere um, as a legislative liaison, and it's great that you are showing interest in wanting to really excel. Um, first, I would definitely take a look at as is advocacy part of the website. There's great how-to guides uh, that we're even updating um, that can really kind of help you get a basis of what as the chapters typically do. Um, if you haven't already, take the advocacy track test that's also found on the website that can kind of help you gauge where your chapter's at and what kind of things might help you improve. But definitely um, reach out and connect with your legislative coordinator, um, whoever that may be on the council. And, you know, we're all 
really excited and want to help everybody really kind of grasp ideas and get things kicked off. But like these guys have mentioned, there's tons of ideas and tons of things we can talk about. But I think uh, just being genuine and genuinely excited about the issues you talk about with your classmates and colleagues and small conversations and at events really goes a long way. So, you know, just keep doing your best with that. Anybody, people can jump in if you had something to add. But. Yeah, no, that was great. I think just emphasizing the fact that, you know, we have advocacy leaders at the local district and national levels, and we're all easily accessible. You know, you can contact us. Uh, we have our contact information here, uh, as well as the group me if you're a legislative liaison. So definitely reach out. And um, and yeah, that's the purpose sort of the, of the group me is to promote uh, that sharing of ideas and brainstorming. Uh, one thing that we're doing right now is kind of analyzing trends and seeing you know what are the strengths and weaknesses of the advocacy branches of each of our as the chapters and how does it measure up uh overall nationwide are there things that we can tackle nationally uh to better each local uh chapter so uh definitely stay in touch using the our communication methods okay our next question here is how do i know if licensure changes have occurred in my state Sure. So it's actually pretty e easily accessible. It's an ASDIS website. Um, if you refer to the COVID-19 state licensure updates on the website, it actually provides information on a state by state basis. Um, and also, if you go to dentallicensure.org, uh, dentallicensure.org, it's the same sort of thing. It's a state licensure map provided by the ADA. So that's dentallicensure.org. All right, next question here is, many students at my school are afraid advocacy is too political or too intimidating. How can we get them involved and show that anyone can be an advocate and that it is bipartisan? Uh, Jake, you wanna tackle this one? I believe you're muted, uh, Jake. Sorry about that. All right, no unmuted now. Uh, yeah, I was saying it's a great question and it can kind of be difficult to navigate. Um, but my best suggestion would be to start on the issues that, um, not that all issues are super partisan, but some are a lot more clear cut than others, especially the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. I know at Colorado that really brought a lot of people together last year and the year before that. Um, just kind of going in depth and learning about um, children with these born with these um, epithelial and craniofacial defects. Um, it really hits home at the heart and, you know, finding something you're passionate about that you can really kind of explain to a bipartisan audience, whatever side of the aisle they're from. Uh, that would be my best advice from Colorado. Uh, thank you, Jake. Um... Yeah, no, and we have a lot of different kind of social events just to gather people around. I know one of the main ones is like red, white, and brew, right? So you can probably imagine what sort of, you know, things happen there, but it's all with the legislative focus in mind, advocacy focus in mind, and um, yeah. All right, so next question here is, how has any of ASDA's legislative priorities changed in light of COVID? Uh, would one of you guys like to take this one? Yeah, I can help out on this one. So as it kind of remains committed to helping out with the legislative priorities and adjusting where we see fit and working with other dental organizations to address the needs of our students. So as an organization, our goal is to represent kind of the interests of dental students um, and adjust based on what those interests are. So the Council on Advocacy and the Board of Trustees are continually looking at what issues are impacting dental students and how we can respond as an organization to successfully and effectively do within our power to be able to help on some of those issues. So those things are examples like licensure. Um, we noticed that um, licensure would be an issue going forward with some of our students due to the inability to take live patient exams. As to swiftly and effectively lobbied in a lot of states to get changes. That's just one example of kind of the power of ASDA and the ability to adjust on the fly and kind of being able to um, you know, be collaborative and work with other organizations and kind of be successful on many issues. Yep, and this is, uh, thank you, Colton. This is a great plug for the advocacy brief, right? Since 
that um, not only does it do like chapter spotlights and things like that of events that are going on, but it definitely specifies any sort of like current and recent events related to COVID specifically, especially during the summer. Um, okay, next question is ADPAC still offering lunch and learn reimbursements? Uh, yes, they are. Great question. And you can actually download the form on our website in order to have that happen. Let's see if we have any more questions here. How do I find speakers for advocacy events? So, uh, Jake, would you like to take this one? Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll just kind of start with, I think one of the silver linings of everything that's been going on is a lot of people are um, working from home and might have a little extra time, especially people working in big organizations and the ADA and the CDA and different things like that. So now is a great opportunity to reach out via email to ASDA alumni, state dental associations, and really anyone you can think of that you think might be interested in, you know, participating with your classmates. That's kind of how the council was able to reach out to the assistant surgeon general of the United States and a, a director at the American Dental Association, because people really want to get involved and help, you know, if they're given the opportunity and have the time. So I would just say go for it. Definitely. Um, I think also starting from who you know best, right? So who had your legislative liaison position before you and before that, who did they contact? Because for a lot of classes, these previous speakers are actually completely new speakers, right? So that's some so somewhere to uh, go from. And like Jake mentioned, the state dental associations, the county and city dental associations for, at New York, we have uh, NYCDS, as well as NISDA, the New York State Dental Association. And we contacted them one day because we wanted some prizes for um, some of our advocacy month events and they actually got us like NYX tickets. We got Oakley sunglasses and things like that that we could give out. So another way to incentivize people attending and learning about advocacy obviously is giving them a little bit of a, a physical incentive, right? Okay, question coming up is what are other legislative issues as the monitors? Greg, would you like to speak on this one? Yeah, thank you. Uh, some other issues would be the opioids crisis, uh, vaping, vaccinations, and even like water fluoridation. Yep, yep, so yeah, so um, I think that covers, if you have any questions specific to that, feel free to let us know. Um, next question is, what are some ideas for encouraging people to vote in a virtual environment? Uh, that is a great question. That is something that we're actually working on right now. So uh, as Jake mentioned, we are working on an updated how-to advocacy guide that will be released in the coming weeks, um, definitely before advocacy month. And that will include a voter registration sort of like event guide and a way to encourage people to get more involved. So definitely look out for that. Again, I also want to uh, mention, you know, incentivizing um, with physical prizes and things like that. So one thing that I know my school is thinking about is, you know, uh, having people send in their I voted stickers uh, through social media or something and people that do that can get entered into a raffle or something like that and that definitely promotes uh, voting uh, let's see anybody else wanted to speak on this one no okay all right so how do you make advocacy more approachable to average members great question um, I think this will also be our last question, by the way. But again, if you guys want to contact us and would like to know more about advocacy, definitely let us know. So the question was, how do you make advocacy more approachable to average members? Uh, Jake, uh, feel free to take this one. All right. Uh, yeah, I think similar to trying to reach and kind of really illustrate that as does a bipartisan advocacy effort, I think it really starts with you know, being genuine and doing the research um, as legislative liaisons and people in roles in advocacy in ASDA, um, 
I think it really helps if we can all kind of study up on the issues and be well prepared to just kind of talk casually with students about advocacy. You know, it doesn't have to be, hey, let's go get coffee and talk about advocacy, but things come up, especially with COVID-19. Whenever I see anybody I used to know, that's all everybody wants to talk about. So maybe we can talk about what ASD is doing to help support dentists during this time, because I know it's really hard for a lot of private practice dentists and ASDA, like uh, Sebastian and some of the guys mentioned, uh, really looked into a lot of different letters that were sent <clears throat> and bills that were sent to the American Student Dental Association and signed on in support and helped advocate for uh, PPP provisions for private practice dentists and um, Medicaid and Medicaid uh, community clinics. Uh, so there's a lot of things that has this done that we can kind of just kind of come up with and talk and get people more comfortable talking about advocacy. Thanks so much, Jake. And yeah, I think that wraps up all the questions. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, I just want to say that this is only the beginning. Let's keep the conversation about advocacy going. If you wanted to know more information, you are free to contact us. Our email that all of council receives is advocacy at asdanet.org. So let me repeat that so you can copy it down. It's advocacy at asdanet.org. So again, let's keep the conversation going. We're very friendly. We do not bite. bite. Um, we're just here to serve you guys first, first and foremost. And yeah, I just wanted to thank all our presenters, Colton, Greg, Jake, as well as our staff, uh, Stephanie and Robin. You guys are rock stars. So I think that wraps it up. Thank you all so much for joining in and hope you have a great night.